and welcome to Market Domination. Happy Earthquake Friday here in New York City. I'm Julie Hyman, that's Josh Lipton, live from our New York City headquarters. We are giving you the ultimate investing playbook to help tune out the noise and make the right moves for your money. And here's your headline blitz, getting you up to speed one hour before the closing bell rings on Wall Street. We can see sustained and broad-based growth across the board. So this is a very strong, another labor market report that demonstrates stable, steady growth. Not just the 303,000 jobs created, but as you said, the unemployment rate has remained under 4% now for over two years. The Fed is going to be watching this to see if the labor market gets hotter and certainly causes them to pause or at least uh, wait until they need to see more uh, improvement in inflation before they start cutting rates. AI uh, was a hype year in 23. 24 will be a uh, start of the implementation and 25 will really be the revenue year. So we still have a ways to go for software. So if you look at companies like Nvidia, Dell, uh, all, all the hardware infrastructure, right? All the attention's there because all, all these companies that are putting AI in are having to put those that critical infrastructure in now. We've got an hour to go until the market close. So let's take a look at the major indexes here. We basically were up, up and away after this morning's jobs report and have pretty much stayed uh, near the highs of the day, rebounding, of course, after some losses earlier in the week on uh, not just the jobs report, but also some continued Fed speak, even after uh, Fed uh, voting member Michelle Bowman said, you know, if the data does support it, maybe we wouldn't even need a cut this year. She said, however, that is not her base case. So we see the Dow rising 310 points or so, about three quarters of 1%. The S&P 500 rising by a percent. The NASDAQ up by about 1.1%. And if we go back to the S&P for just a moment and take a look at the week here, still down on the week. We've only had, I believe, five weeks that have been lower this year for the S&P 500. This is the second worst week, on track at least, for the second worst week, with a drop of about 1.1%. And then looking on over to the sector action and what we see See today, it is a pretty broad-based rally with the exception of utilities here. It's industrials and communication services and tech that are helping lead the gains that we are seeing today. Um, so a little bit of a cyclical rotation here out of the some more defensive sectors, Josh. And Julie, labor market uh, continued to impress in March as employers added 303,000 jobs. That was much more than economists have been looking for. But is this enough to get the Fed to start cutting rates? Let's welcome in Michael Gapin, B of A Securities Head of U.S. Economics. Michael, it is good to see you. So let's just start with that jobs report. Stronger than expected. Michael, give us your take. What were your big takeaways? You know, well, certainly, as you mentioned, major upside surprise to growth in employment, adding 300,000 jobs on the month. But the key here for the outlook for, for the Fed is, does it create overheating effects? And I think the answer is still no. So for me, the most important figure today was really that average hourly earnings number rising three-tenths on the month and 4.1% year on year. That's a little above where the Fed would say is consistent with 2% inflation outcomes, but it's the lowest pace of wage growth on a year on year basis that we've seen in the past three to four years. So I think it, it fits that supply side narrative they've been telling. A rebound in the labor force gives a strong employment growth. It keeps the unemployment rate low, but it hasn't changed their view that disinflation should continue. So, Michael, um, at the same time, there is a little bit of a narrative emerging from a certain cohort that says maybe we won't see any rate cuts this year, right? Torsten Slock over at Apollo is one of those folks. Michelle Bowman bringing it up as at least a possibility today. Do you give any credence to those kinds of views? We do, absolutely. And I think the inflation data is probably most important in terms of deciding whether the Fed can cut or when it can cut. But that activity data and the data we saw in the labor market today suggests, well, even if they do start, maybe the pace will be slower or ultimately the terminal rate will be higher, right? So there's kind of three components to this, the when to start, how fast to go, and when to end. And I would look at the labor market data saying it's still reasonable for the Fed to consider cuts this year. 
but you know, maybe the pace will, will be slower. Um, so we're not quite at the point where we're thinking no cuts this year, but certainly a slower pace or a higher terminal is in the cards. And Michael, as you think about kind of the trajectory of inflation from here, what does it look like? Well, I think that you know, the key for us next week, uh, we do look for core CPI to rise by only two tenths on the month. So we're essentially looking for whether we get indication that the, the January and February data is more of a one-off. It's consistent with the so-called January effect where many firms increase their prices at the beginning of the year, but it's a one-off story, not a change in, in the trend. So for us, opening the, the door to Fed cuts is about further disinflation. We think core PCE will fall to around 2.6% year on year in, in the fourth quarter. So it'll be a, a more shallow disinflation process from here, but we think it's one that will continue and be enough to, to get the Fed started with rate cuts, we think in June, but perhaps it comes later. Michael, we've seen um, interest rate, uh, excuse me, gasoline prices that have been uh, creeping up here. And of course, inflation expectations on the part of consumers are an important then sort of circling back into inflation. So it, how much of a concern is that? Yeah, so I would say it's a it's a headwind, it's a mild headwind to our outlook for disinflation. So not only gasoline and oil prices, but other commodity prices have been moving higher. Our commodity strategists have been revising higher their outlook for many important and key commodity prices. The Fed doesn't really control those, but it is something that would give you, you know, upward pressure on headline inflation. It would be a drag on consumer spending and, and likely slow the disinflation process. So right now we'd say it's not enough to change our view, but it's a risk and it's something we're watching. Michael, I'm also interested to get to sort of your general grade on the overall economy now, right, Michael? And, and why don't you think Americans feel better about that economy? Yeah, but our, our overall view, I think, is, is pretty constructive and optimistic. We agree with the supply side narrative that the Fed has, has embraced most, most recently that what we're really seeing is a rebound in the labor force. It's in increasing the capacity of the economy to grow without generating overheating effects, and that's really benefiting uh, everybody. So it ends up, what starts out with a rebound in the labor force ends up with a story about stronger employment, stronger income growth, and, and greater spending. I think maybe why it hasn't percolated through to consumers, there's a number of reasons. But I think one is simply the difference between the price level and the rate of inflation. What people like me talk about is, oh, inflation is slowing. That doesn't mean the price level is falling. It just means it's rising at a slower rate. So I think households are still adjusting to what has been a big level shift upward in the price level over, over the past few years. So, you know, the data says we should be feeling good about things on a macro level, but I certainly understand why, you know, it's difficult at the household level to, to digest the higher prices we've seen. Michael, maybe one of the other things affecting sentiment this year in particular is that there's a presidential election coming up. And I'm curious, not just how you're thinking about how it's affecting consumer sentiment, but also, you know, if you are saying there's a possibility the Fed could start to cut later than then forecast, we start getting close to the election. And so I know the Fed says they're not political, but you have to wonder if that starts to factor into their decision making. Yeah, my, my view is that, um, you know, I used to work there, so maybe I'm a homer and I'm biased, but I, I do think that the Fed tries to make these decisions independent of the election cycle. So I think that ultimately, their credibility is best served by conducting policy the right way. And if they think cuts are justified, they should do it. If they think delaying rate cuts is justified, they, they should do that. So in, in my view, I, I don't think the election timing is really a major influence on, on what they're deciding. And Michael, we, we've had strategists on the show this week, and some of them questioned, um, you know, why should the Fed cut it all? You know, the economy is strong, labor market's solid, consumers hanging in there. Why, why rock the boat? What's your response to that? Yeah, it's, it's a good question and certainly one that, that I receive um, frequently. And I, I would say at least from the... What the Fed is saying and what policymakers are saying is, yeah, right, right now it's, it's the U.S. economy is pretty interest rate insensitive and the economy is growing well despite higher policy rates. Their fear would be that if inflation keeps trending lower, as it has been, 
then you're getting a de facto tightening of, of the policy stance because the nominal policy rate is elevated, inflation's falling, your real policy rate is tightening. So I think their worry would be if we stay at this level for too long, then we could reverse some of the labor market gains that, that we've had, and we don't need to do that to bring inflation down. So I, I think that's probably the main reason the Fed would, would say that, you know, why they're looking to, to cut rates, even though the broader economy looks just fine. Michael, thank you so much for helping us kick off the show today. Appreciate it. Thank you. Taking a look now at oil, the price of Brent crude on the rise again here, reaching $91 a barrel in today's trade. So um, this has been interesting, Julie. Price is moving now back up to their highest level really in months. Brent is up about 4% this week. And we know, you know, different sort of factors driving this strong economy. Obviously, we were just talking to Michael about the jobs report we, we got today, Blockbuster, OPEC production cuts. But also, of course, you know, geopolitical conflict is also front and center as well. Yeah, and it's become more, I mean, at this point, as we know, when you have a geopolitical conflict that then goes on for a little while without any meaningful change, it doesn't affect consistently necessarily the price of an asset. But this week, when we had speculation and reports out of Israel that it was anticipating some sort of retaliatory attack from Iran, that's then the you know X factor or the latest catalyst that helped push prices higher. We did speak to some folks this week who said there's a lot of speculation in the oil mm -hmm. market as well. Yep. So you have to keep that in mind. Um, it looks like we're setting up for the best week for WTI since February 9th in terms of the magnitude of the gain and the best for the XLE, that's the energy ETF, going back to January 26th. But there was still underperformance on the part of those energy stocks versus the actual commodity. That's something we're going to talk about a little bit later in the show, but it is something that the um, energy stock bulls have been pointing out here. Yeah, it is a question, and we are talking about smart strategists later about this, about at what point, Julie, it becomes more of an issue for the, the Fed. Like, if you have Brent at 91, right. is, it, yeah. is it 95, is it 100, and sort of in, and staying there? So we'll, we'll ask some smart people later about yeah. that. Yeah, well, we just talked to Michael Gabe, and he said it is something to keep an eye yep. on. All right, we're just getting started here on market domination. Coming up, Elon Musk denying a report from Reuters that Tesla is canceling its plans for a low-cost car. We'll speak to an analyst on the other side as shares of the EV maker are sliding today. We've got that and much more when market domination returns.
Tesla is reportedly canceling its plans for a low-cost car. This is according to Reuters. Tesla CEO Elon Musk took to social media to say in an X post that Reuters is lying again. For more on this, let's bring in Roth MKM senior research analyst Craig Irwin. So, Craig, you know, Reuters citing um, various internal memos as well as employees that it spoke with um, in the source of this report. How, how seriously are you taking it? Um, and, you know, we know already that if they are still planning this car, it's not coming out for a while. Yeah, you know, it, it is coming out. It's coming out in 25, right? I expect it to come out. I've been talking about this car since 2019 when they punted on the original uh, production decision. They were thinking that, gee, it's going to be margin dilutive versus where they are now actually would have been accretive. Um, Reuters probably just caught some lower level employees at one of the factories um, that has been scratched off the list. Um, and, uh, you know, this is why channel checks are uh, are difficult. You know, sometimes even when you talk to people you think are the right people, they can give you bad information. Um, it's it's very important to talk to people that, that operate at a, the most senior level and uh, have transparency in the industry. Um, you know, the mini cars coming is going to be an important part of Tesla's mix going forward. Uh, we don't know exactly where it's going to be made, um, but, you know, chatter is maybe India. Um, you know, the last thinking was uh, Germany, um, but it's a possibility that uh, it's made in Mexico or in, or in Fremont or another facility, right? So, you know, this is in flux. It's in development. They're probably, you know, working through a bake-off, an internal bake-off right now, and that's the, the misunderstanding, I think, that made its way off into the market. And Craig, big picture pricing, you know, does pricing have to come down if we're going to see a kind of reacceleration in EV sales? So, so here's the thing. People know me as a bear on Tesla. I'm bearish on the valuation, right? But I'm a bull on EVs for the long term. Why? Because EVs are so compelling. 65% fewer components. They should be cheaper than ICE vehicles, right? So, you know, if price comes down dramatically on these you know, maybe shorter range, um, smaller vehicles, something comparable to like a Mini Cooper or something like that. You know, you could have a really compelling, inexpensive vehicle uh, that would be a massive seller in Europe and a great second car here in the U.S. Yes, price matters. Price is extremely important, both on the existing, you know, units that are that are offered offered out there, the different models. Um, but in the longer run, you know, this Mini car is essential, and it's essential to the the long term viability. And you know, frankly, it'll be it'll be a cost puller. It'll help them get cost out in the other areas of the business. And then this uh, modular manufacturing approach, it's going to be transformational. You know, the, the the former Tesla engineers are all telling me, pay attention. You know, Musk can get it right. They all know how skeptical I am. You know, he's always late. But uh, you know, cost is everything. And and when you have a, a a great car that has better integration with technology, and you know, it's cheaper than your ICE alternative you know, it's going to be a compelling future, and that's what Musk's building for. Craig, I, I, I just got to push back a little bit uh, on your skepticism about this report. I mean, why are you so confident that it is indeed, as you characterize it, lower-level employees who maybe are mistaking, you know, that there are, are numerous versions of this car in the works, and maybe it's just one of them that's, or two of them that's been axed here? So as an example, right, when I talk about channel checks, um, I will tell my my clients I talk to one of the three largest buyer of batteries in the world. One of those is Tesla, so I'm not going to identify exactly who it is, right? But it's a legal, legitimate channel check with without fiduciary, right? When we discuss things, we're very careful about what is, um, you know, open and in the clear. You know, for something like Tesla, you know, I, I talked to several former engineers that are also fiduciaries. I talked to the um, the largest competitors. You know, I look at this and I see where have I made mistakes and where have I seen other analysts make mistakes. You know, it just looks like it looks like they were talking to, you know, people in a facility that that lost the bake off, right? And 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 the bake off should be going on right now. Um, so, you know, bad information. And then, hey, Musk isn't one to mince words. <laughs> You know, I wouldn't have said lying. I would just say there's a misunderstanding. And I, I might have, you know, tried to politely correct it myself. But, you know, Musk is a little bit contentious with the press these days. These um, days. And, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Every day. Um, you know, listen, people get things wrong. I get things wrong. You know, I'm not, there's no malice in this. 
Craig, you have a neutral on the name. What would you need to see before getting more bullish on Tesla? I, I see this as egregiously overvalued. I don't think they have anything that Toyota doesn't, right? Toyota and Panasonic are in the same Koretsu. Um, anyone can buy from uh, China ETL, uh, which is a, a major supplier of Teslas. You know, I think this thing should probably trade at a valuation much closer to that of Toyota, which means, you know, hey, the stock can get cut in half um, and probably still have some downsides. So, you know, I think we need the other side of this, this bearish period and this market creation period, and they need to take the margin dilution of the mini car on the chin and go out there as a leader, and that'll allow them to expand margins in the long run. When that has something with visibility on it, you're, 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 you're looking at a long-term winner. Uh, right now, you know, you're know you looking at continued estimates cuts, um, continued negative revisions. You know, analysts behaving like this miss was a surprise when we all know the EV market's in tough shape right now. You know, it's, it's definitely not time to be long the equity, probably short, um, but I think that there are things they can do that'll surprise the upside, which is why I'm, uh, you know, more cautious in, in saying short the stock. I just, you know, kind of, I think it's one to avoid as a long, um, but, but an interesting market leader. And always interesting to talk about, Craig. Really appreciate you joining us. It's good to catch up with you. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good weekend. Well, let's check in now on another call of the day that we are watching here. UBS has raised its price target on Spotify to 375 from 274, maintaining a buy rating on shares of Spotify or on on the shares of the company. Uh, Spotify higher by about five percent here um, on that call in today's session. And basically, this is sort of a roundup, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, UBS commenting on the progress that the company is making and improving its profitability in top line growth as well, price increases, which were reported upon earlier in the week, although they might not have taken or happened yet, and they're not officially announced by Spotify mm -hmm. yet, but it's still something that these UBS folks are watching. Yeah, they, they say, listen, we expect Q1 results to highlight this continued improvement in profitability, solid top line growth as price increases flow through. Remember, Spotify those Q1 earnings are on deck coming later this month on April 23rd. Certainly expectations plenty high. Julie, the stock is already up more than 60% this year. Wow. Moving on, stocks rebounding on the heels of the stronger than expected March jobs report. We're seeing treasuries come under some pressure as the 10-year yield edges up to 4.37%. But yields hit their highest level of the year early this week with the 10-year top in 43 for 2%. Joining us now is Kelly Kolowski, Mass Mutual Portfolio Manager. Kelly, it is good to see you. So let's start with that jobs report. You call it a blowout number, Kelly. Were you surprised by the strength you saw there? Good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Yes, I think we were thinking there may be some slowdown from February, but certainly a strong report, strong revisions, which, which we've been watching. We saw growth across cyclical and non-cyclical sectors. So it really tells us uh, not a lot of urgency here for the Fed to begin reducing interest rates looking at this report. Um, and if that's the case, I mean, I think you think that the, the markets are perhaps getting the Fed wrong here. In, in what sense? Well, they've consistently gotten the Fed wrong, I think, for, you know, going back several months. If we go back just two months ago, there was a certain probability that the Fed was going to begin cutting in March and they've gotten that wrong. I think there is still the hope that we're going to get that three cuts this year. That's probably not a you know unfair estimate. That's cer certainly possible, but we do see a risk that we could see less than three cuts this year for sure. So I'm thinking about the, the Fed's rate path, less than three, Kelly, and, and when do you think they might start cutting? Well, right now, the, the base case for the market is June, and there's about a 50% probability. Between now and June, we have two more payroll rep reports and three CPI reports. So that does give us enough time for them to assess more data. They've told us they're data dependent. Um, so I, I think our, our base case is probably second or third quarter that they would want to get that started, assuming that we do see a little bit more progress on the inflation front, which is very important. And even as the market is pricing in cuts that are still coming, uh, bond yields have been actually rising a bit this week. Uh, we saw, and we saw a couple of weeks ago, a big move upward, another big up move upward this week. So what do you make of that move and how far do you think that can go? Yeah, we we've, have seen this consistently repricing. I think the markets have been very reactive to single data points. If you look at the, many, the ISM manufacturing uh, 
economic data that we got earlier this week, there was a big reaction to that. And then you sort of had counter reaction with the services um, PMI. So there's just, I think the markets are a little bit too um, t- taking on sort of one data point at a time. But I think the, the point is that we came into this year sort of thinking that we were going to get way more cuts than uh, we're probably going to get. And we're kind of seeing that sort of correct itself. So, Kelly, for f- fixed income investors who are listening right now, where are the opportunities, in your opinion? So we at Mass Mutual, we are bond buyers. We, you know, we back insurance products with fixed income. We're very focused on high quality. And if you look at investment grade bond yields, you know, you can earn 5.4 percent and, and lock in a pretty attractive sort of seven year duration. So we like staying high quality investment grade bonds. I think single A and, tri- and triple B rated bonds and sort of staying in your uh, you know, short to intermediate tenors. We don't think you're getting paid a lot for going down much in credit quality or going out on the curve. So that's really uh, where we like and, and where we think is, is a good spot for most investors. So Kelly, we, you know, we talk about the Fed day in and day out, the market focused on the Fed day in and day out. Um, in terms of what people are maybe not paying enough attention to, maybe we're too Fed focused, um, I know that you're looking at sort of the fiscal position of the United States. What do you think specifically we should be focusing on there right now? That's a great question because everyone is asking why hasn't the economy slowed if the Fed's been hiking interest rates so much? And that's because the the government is actually working, you know, counterproductive to what the Fed is doing and stimulating the economy right now. Um, so we see that as sort of a risk when we think about volatility in Treasury yields and the reception to auctions. We did see it have an impact sort of last year uh, in the in the third and fourth quarter. So we think that the unsustainable fiscal position of the U.S. government is, is a risk and something that we should think about as we think about the, the premium you're pricing into sort of long dated Treasuries and U.S. government debt. And with the presidential election coming this year, there has been a little bit of reporting that voters are paying a little bit of attention to this issue. But as we've seen traditionally, there hasn't been any real meaningful movement on this from either side of the aisle. Does that change this year? I know you're not a political analyst, but, you know, from from the market's perspective, any chance of that this year? So we think the election is certainly going to uh, introduce some volatility into the market. We don't see it really materially changing what's going on in Washington. Unfortunately, our country is very uh, divided right now. It's probably, uh, you know, may even get worse with the election. So we think it's um, probably not going to certainly help the fiscal situation. Um, But we do see probably a certainty for volatility in the second half of the year. All right. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks for joining us. Have a great weekend. Thanks. Take care. Coming up, it's the latest edition of our series, Goodbye or Goodbye. We'll get investor insight on two stocks to help you make the best choices for your portfolio. Stick around. Much more market domination on the other side.
It's a big, noisy universe of stocks out there. Welcome to Goodbye or Goodbye. Our goal to help cut through that noise to navigate the best moves for your portfolio. Today, we're digging into the highly competitive semiconductor industry. So what's the best way to play your asset allocation? Let's bring in Dryden Pence, Chief Investment Officer for Pence Capital Management. Thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Great to be here. Thanks so for having me. Let's get straight to your buy here. And it is Taiwan Semiconductor, which has been much in the headlines as of late, but really always is when we have the semiconductor conversation. The stock's done well over the past year. And you actually call it the world's most important company, which definitely stood out to me in, in your notes on, on the segment here. Why is it the world's most important company? Taiwan Semi occupies a very key place in everything that has to happen with AI. When you t think about chips, are going, our demand for chips, our demand for data is going to be five times greater in 2025 than it was in 2019. The fact is that 90% you know, of the really high value chips and the really important ones are made by Taiwan Semi. So they're the absolute choke point. They're 30% of the of cost of goods sold of, of AMD and, and for NVIDIA as well. So they're absolutely essential to everything that's happening in AI and in chips going forward. Yeah, and as you also point out, the market share is pretty massive here when we were talking about the most advanced chips. And, and just to be clear to viewers who are not familiar, because we talk about semiconductor companies all the time, Taiwan is a so-called foundry. So they're actually physically making the chips that other companies design. Exactly. And and because they are, and because they're that foundry, they're just absolutely essential. We call it the choke point, right? No one is able to accomplish their long-term mission without using Taiwan Semi. So that gives them pricing power. And pricing power is going to turn into long-term excess earnings. So that's one reason why we, we like the stock for short-term, long-term, and all the way through. Interesting. And that 90% market share is just astonishing. And then finally as well, um, you say their technology is far ahead of competitors because there are certainly other companies who are in the business but they're not close in size. Exactly, and they're able, Taiwan Semi has this unique ability to build upon their successes and kind of maintain their initiative in this. So as they working through not only their processes, but where they are, but their technology, and they're fully integrated into all the other big players. No one can really do their business without Taiwan Semi. So because of that, we think that it, it, it's, you know, they're gonna continue to have this continual product renewal when you think of, I think Moore's Law, even as, as things get better. So I think when you think of it as a foundry, it's the absolute essential building block for the future of AI. Interesting. Okay. So as we always do, we like to talk about what could be a potential risk. And we got a little bit of a renewal of this conversation over the past week. Now, you say the risk is the geopolitical issue. Obviously, there was an earthquake in Taiwan as well, right. which thankfully did not damage um, the production capacity, it seems, but it did renew this idea that we are so reliant on this company and its operations in Taiwan. Well, that I mean, it is it is a geographic risk. It's a geopolitical risk. I think they're working to move production out of Taiwan to globally diversify. That will certainly help earthquakes, but it'll also uh, help the situation with the risk of, of a China conflict. So I think that when we look at how they're going to do this, they're able to take their capital, deploy it globally, uh, and bring their technology into various other places. I mean, we learned from COVID why it's important to have supply chains uh, you know, more localized as opposed to completely globalized. So with regards to Taiwan Semi, I think the point is moving their production outside of Taiwan to other places of the world ameliorate that particular risk as well as put us in a situation where we don't have that same constriction it should whether it's famine disease right. covid earthquake what whatever have it you. is Oof. right um, and just quickly before we move on to the stock you're avoiding do you have a position in TSMC yes we do okay. yes we do we we do and many of our clients do okay so, gotcha yes. so let's move on to the stock you don't like that is trying to compete with Taiwan semi we should say and that is Intel um, and as we know the stock has had a bit of a rocky ride especially recently so firstly there's the legacy business. Right. And, you know, if you, if you look for a company that's kind of, you could say they lost their mojo, uh, it's Intel. Uh, and, and, the, and the problem that they have is they really, for the longest time, they were so dominant, I think they just got, maybe they got lazy. Uh, maybe they just didn't innovate enough. But whatever it is, they're losing market share to Taiwan Semi. They're losing market share to anybody else in the business. And they're really not able to keep up with their innovation. And I think that that's it's really important. You can take a look at companies over time 
that kind of lose their ability to innovate. I mean, you can look at IBM, you know, or something like that, massively dominant at one point, and then they become less effective. And so we worry about Intel in that sense. They, they're really going to have to work hard to kind of reassert themselves. Yeah, although you could argue IBM has come back again, so maybe at some point. And one of the ways Intel is trying to do that is to build its foundry business. So basically to more directly compete with the likes of a Taiwan Semi and others by making its own manufacturing capacity. Exactly, and I think that they're, they, they, you know, they, at one point there was 61% of the market, but now they've you know, fallen yeah. dramatically, right? So now they're gonna have to redeploy and work directly uh, to increase their foundry capabilities. They're trying to compete with Taiwan Semi, but Taiwan Semi is so many years ahead of them. So when you, 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 not only do we look at it as one to avoid in and of itself, but we certainly look at it as one to avoid in contrast and in comparison mm -hmm. to the other players, because they're really years ahead, ahead of them. Them. Right. And, and as you point out, Intel just came out with an update as well with some numbers around the foundry business that disappointed the market. Yeah, and they're losing money. I mean, yeah. the, the, you know, the short answer is, yeah, we're trying to make a huge investment in this, but we're we're losing money and we're not really catching up. And I think that that's one of the, the, the big things. I mean, the, you know, their losses ballooned over to se up to $7 billion in right. this segment. So I think you have to be careful with this. And that's kind of one reason why it's on the, on the avoid list. Yeah, and then one last thing that is the other sort of um, point of contrast with Taiwan semi is the the dominance with major industry customers and that technological edge that you pointed out exactly and I think when you take a look at Qualcomm AMD Broadcom all the other you know those those companies where, where you know 30 40 percent of their cost of goods sold is with, with TSMC and and you see Intel trying to move into that the problem is is supply chains are so tight demand is so high people are not going to want to disrupt something mm -hmm. that's working. So it's going to be very hard for Intel to kind of get back in to those systems. And gotcha. I think that they, they've just got a hard road to go. Now, that doesn't mean they, they can't do it, right? Uh, they, they probably can, but I don't think that, I don't think they're going to catch up with someone like TSMC anytime soon. Gotcha. And I guess that last point is sort of the risk to the downside. What could go right? Well, it could work, the foundry it, it could work. effort. Um, and maybe work better and sooner than some investors. Expect. I think the biggest thing I mentioned earlier, how we see this five-fold increase in demand for data between 2019 and 2025. I mean, AI and everything. There's more data demand, more chips demand. It's in everything. I mean, they, there's chips and electric toothbrushes. I mean, you know, I mean, yeah. when you get when you get into, it. and so what's go, what can go right for them, is that this just tremendous demand is there and maybe their second or third or fourth place, but second or third or fourth place is still profitable mm -hmm. when demand is, is, is massive, right? right? And so I think that's the thing that can go right in this scenario, gotcha. uh, is that you just, you just, TSMC can't keep up and, and other people can't keep up, and so they, you know, there's enough to go around, and so their their business is going to be okay. Right. It's not a zero-sum gain in exactly. another game, in other words. Um, it's an ever-expanding pie. Yeah. Um, position in Intel? Uh, very, very minor. Okay, very, very gotcha. Minor. Only, only legacy positions that, gotcha. that are held on to for tax reasons. Okay, so, yeah. so let's uh, sort of summarize what you're telling folks here. Basically, you say buy Taiwan Semiconductor as it's a key AI cho choke point. The most important company in the world for that reason dominates market share years ahead of its competitors technologically. On the other side, you say avoid Intel. It has lost its technological edge, and that foundry segment is not yet up to snuff. Thanks so much. Appreciate Absolutely. it, Dryden. Thank you. And thank you for watching Goodbye or Goodbye. You can catch episodes here three times a week at 3.30 p.m. Eastern. GE completing its energy spinoff under the new name GE Vernova. RBC Capital Markets initiating coverage on that stock with an outperform rating this week. For more, we're talking to the author of that note, RBC Capital Markets analyst Chris Dendrinos. Chris, it is good to see you. And maybe just to start kind of at a high level, Chris, um, interested to get your take on the kind of the overall strategy here. GE decided to split into these three independent businesses. The right move in your opinion, Chris? Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think the way that I think about it is if you look at, you know, a multinational conglomerate, the idea behind that business structure is you have economies of scale and you can benefit from cost savings there. But what happens in a business like that is there's naturally capital allocation decisions that go on and, you know, everyone everywhere prioritizes their best investments first. And so for GE that has, you know, a different margin profile across that business, you know, aerospace is fantastic. Energy can be fantastic, but it's a lower margin business than aerospace. And so 
I think naturally, you know, that business gets underinvested in. And as a spin out, as a standalone business, now the only investments that this company can make are in the energy business. And so you have an opportunity here to prioritize everything and, you know, execute and accelerate the, the transformation. So I think it's I think it's definitely the right move for them. And Chris, Vernova operates sort of across different types of sub sub energy sectors, if you will, right? Whether it be solar, wind, et cetera. How should we think about its comparables? Who are its main competitors in that space? Or does it sort of stretch across other different sub industries? Yeah, yeah, sure. So so GE Vernova, they're they're a leader in, in each of the segments they play in. And so maybe starting with the wind portfolio. Um, you know the key players there are, are Simmons Energy, Vestas, and, and Nordics. And in the U.S., they have a leading position. In the U.S., it, it, or in the in Europe, it's competitive, and they maybe have you know a 10 or 15 uh, percent know, market market share there. Um, if you shift over to to the power segment, it's Mitsubishi, it's them, it's uh, Simmons there as well. And so, you know, they're another they're another leader there. They have a number two market share in that segment. And then in the electrification portfolio, it's, it's a broad no, number of players. The you know, ABBs, the Schneider Electrics, you've got Simmons there as well. Um, so there's you know a broad level of competition across every space. But you know the the it's a small it's a small pool of, of companies they're competing against. And Chris, <clears throat> how does valuation look to you for this name? You you argue there's more room to run. Yeah, yeah, and so the way I'm thinking about this, and if you if you look through the the company's financials and and their expectations, you have a, a multi-year pathway here of of performance and improvement and growing free cash flow that is well above any of their comp group, and so my argument is you need to look out a, a, a really long way to see that growth and appreciate the the value that that's being created there. So our argument is, is that you don't look at 2024, don't look at 2025, look at 2026. And that's a period of time where uh, the business looks more normalized to us right now. What they're doing is they're working through a backlog of, of unprofitable wind uh, wind losses in, in that portfolio, and those sort of roll off completely in 2026. And that's when you get that full, clean picture of what the true cash flow flow story of this company looks like. And so our argument is, you know, look out that far. Uh, Put it in, um, you know, a multiple that's in line with with the multi-industrial average, and you get a really, really attractive valuation and a, uh, and a lot of upside and a lot of free cash flow that I think is ultimately going to get returned to shareholders. Chris, if you look at um, other companies, for example, in your coverage companies, I, I use sort of the the TAN ETF sometimes as shorthand for the solar industry. It's one example. It has not been doing great over the past year. We have seen some declines, and so. Maybe if you could talk us, to us about the sort of bigger renewable space um, and where we are in, in that cycle. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, right now the, the, the industry is challenged. And if you think about on the solar panel side, um, you know, you've got an oversupply situation that has put pressure on pricing. Uh, you know, taking a step back and thinking more at the macro level, you've got interest rates that have been, you know, uh, high and you've got uh, inflation and in, in, in pricing. And so what that's done is it's, um, you know, it, it's created challenges for the industry to to compete against other technologies. And the reason is, is because uh, you know, solar as a whole, it, it, it's one of the most interest rate sensitive uh, investments because there's a lot of capital spend up front and then there's little maintenance uh, on a go forward basis. <clears throat> And so the, these companies are challenged because the demand has has gone down. As a result, there's developers that, um, you know, traditionally use a lot of debt to finance these projects, and because debt is expensive, they are are no longer attractive investments. Um, and then on top of that, you've got things like um, you know, interconnection delays and and equipment backlogs, uh, order backlogs that can that can stretch multiple multiple years. And so, it's difficult to to go out and and contract a project uh, to get built today. It, you have to wait wait a couple of years. Yeah, definitely. And obviously the interest rate cycle playing a role in all of that. Chris Dendrinos, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> well, despite today's gains on the back of a robust jobs report, the S&P 500 is still on track for a losing week. We'll talk what the pullback means for your portfolio in our investor playbook. That's next.
A stronger than expected jobs report boosted stocks today after a string of weak sessions, but the S&P 500 is still on track for a losing week. We're looking at how to navigate the big picture with the Yahoo Finance playbook, and we're joined by Rob Williams, Sage Advisory Managing Partner and Chief Investment Strategist, and Ken Mahoney, Mahoney Asset Management CEO. Thanks, guys, for being here. It's good to see you. So, Rob, you. Um, I want to go to you first, because this was a little bit of a rockier week, capped by the jobs report today that seemed to reassure the markets, but did it feel like a turning point for you at all, or is it just now full speed ahead, next thing, the CPI? No, to, you, to your point, we've had a lot of really good economic news the last couple weeks, uh, and this past week the market has not run. So I think the market uh, is car starting to respect the fact that the rate picture, you know, the, the possible outcomes on the rate picture has widened because of strong data. Uh, and, and maybe respect some of the geopolitical risks and some of the complacency we've had. Um, you know, it's a very, you can't ignore the job report was very strong, but if you crack it open and you can't poke too many holes, but my only criticism is something we all know is a lot of this is still driven by deficit spending and spending. You know, half of those 300,000 uh, jobs were driven by government related sectors, government directly or, or some of the healthcare uh, components of jobs that are kind of driven by government spending. So, you know, uh, it, there's been a lot of complacency. It's good data, but I think, you know, we're still in the camp that there's some, la the, it, there is a monetary lag effect and it's been extended because of fiscal spending and we don't know when that's going to come to an end. So the markets are acting like we're heading right into another expansion, but maybe they're starting to think twice about that now. Ken, same question to you. Just start big picture here, Ken. Your, your thoughts on the market, where we are and, and where you think we're headed. Well, nice little bungee jump we had yesterday, right down, right back, right back up, almost recapturing all those points yesterday. Look, I thought it was overdone. I thought it was overreaction. The Fed governor said, I penciled in. Okay, maybe it's not ink, but pencil's pretty good enough anyway, that we may see two rate cuts. Look, I've always been in the camp that be careful what you wish for. We don't want a whole bunch of rate cuts because that's a company with slower economic activity. Uh, look, we saw the volatility index lift. Remember, the VIX is interesting. It doesn't really give us the direction, but it kind of shows complacency versus, hey, we're trying to put some hedges out there. It's telling you that, hey, things get a little bit dicey in the macro, geopolitical, but I do think some of these concerns are going to ease a bit when we get to the third, fourth week uh, here in April when we start reporting the first quarter numbers. And I expect a lot of technology companies to beat and raise guidance. So look, it's possible to have a two-tiered market, kind of like, hey, it's a tale of two stock markets, technology and everything else. I think technology doesn't really mind whether you have a quarter point cut or don't have a cut. Top line growth is what's going to attract investors. So I think, yes, it's important that we follow this, but I think for those growth investors, which we are, we don't really care so much whether we get a June cut or not. We care more about the earnings picture and hopefully find a lot of those companies that beat and raise guidance. Yeah, and obviously we're, it feels like we just finished earnings and now we're getting back into earnings to your point. Okay. Um, Rob, I know when we're looking at groups here, a couple of the groups that you like are energy and healthcare. Um, and just in a bit of trivia on the week, those were the best performing groups in the form of energy and the worst performing group, I believe, in terms of healthcare or among the worst performers on the week. Um, so why, why do you like those two different groups? I think you want to start thinking about diversifying, especially if you've been looking like the index, uh, you, you're very concentrated. So I, I do think it is attractive in a couple ways because it is later in the cycle. So I think it makes sense to continue having tech and growth. But if you take a quality spin to it, if you screen for high quality, uh, high free cash flow, things like energy uh, screen very highly, healthcare, pharmaceuticals, you know, that that's still kind of, a lot of those are, can be in the mega cap sort of growth bucket, but they have those other characteristics. They have a little more defensive flavor to it. Energy is really the only sector that's, you could consider cheap. Uh, so you have some valuation on your side there. Uh, but I like our the growth variety uh, kind of expressed in a high quality tilt and, and looking for high free cash flow. Uh, and it, that that's where you trimming down some of the most overvalued, overcrowded areas of market, but still participating. So those two in particular look 
look good over the medium term, I think. And Ken, back to you. I know you said this earnings season, you're looking for a, a lot of tech names to beat and raise. One name you like, Ken, is NVIDIA. Now that stock's already ripped about 80% uh, this year, but you still like it here, Ken. You know, I always hear about how expensive it is. And I look at last week, Nike came out and I'm like, that's expensive. Their Ford PE is 35, as is NVIDIA. By the way, NVIDIA's Ford PE, on average for the last 10 years has been 35. But with Nike, they're talking about top line growth of 1%. And here with the video, we're looking at 90 to 100% top line growth. So look, if rear view mirror, very expensive from the video. But remember, it's not like what Wayne Gretzky says. It's not where the puck is, where the puck is going. And I think they made a strong case with AI, especially Jensen at the uh, AI conference, that we're probably in the second or third inning of this. So if we get caught too much in valuations, I think we may miss this. So yes, it is it is pricey. Uh, it is expensive, 35 forward earnings, but that's been where they've been. Uh, that's where they are. And there's a lot of other companies trading at 35 uh, four Ps that don't have anywhere near uh, the top line growth potential like NVIDIA has. And, and just quickly on NVIDIA, I, I know you're a long time holder, but it's different being a buyer and a holder, right? So would you right. add to positions or start a position if you didn't have one in NVIDIA at these right. levels? Right, good question. So, you know, we're looking at eight, eight, 800, 820. Uh, if we pull back there, it should probably be a pretty good setup. Uh, remember, they're a little bit off cycle as far as when earnings come out, so they won't be reporting the end of April, it'll be the end of May. Um, but again, it, look, look, again, it should be on your shopping list, maybe keep an open order there, you know, below the market. Uh, but again, we think uh, definitely if AI is in a second or third inning, may not want to stay around for the ninth inning or extra innings, <laughs> but certainly that's a pretty good runway, still make money, even though it feels pricey. Try buying a pullback if you don't have it already. Ken, Rob, thank you guys both for joining us. Appreciate thank it. Thank Later. you. Have a great weekend. You too. While we're wrapping up today's market domination, don't go anywhere. We've got you covered with all the action following the closing bell. Stay tuned for market domination overtime. It's the closing bell on Wall Street, and now it is market domination overtime. We're joined by Jared Blickery to get you up to speed on the action from today's session. Let's talk about where the major averages ended up. And by the way, 
You probably heard there was an earthquake today in New York City. That happened around 10.30 a.m. I don't know if people stepped away from their desks for a minute to figure out what the heck was happening, but stocks rallied. Um, earthquake or no earthquake for those folks who were participating from the New York region. The Dow finishing the day up about eight-tenths of 1%. The S&P 500 uh, finishing higher by 1.1%. And the Nasdaq, the winner on the day, up by one and a quarter percent here. Uh, also, of course, watching what was going on in the bond market. And what's interesting here is you get this data today, you get a seven, point, seven basis point increase in the 10-year yield, and you still get that NASDAQ winning. So back to bond yields going higher here and uh, stocks going higher as well, which is more of a traditional relationship where you have bond prices go down and stock price go up or, or vice versa for that matter. Elsewhere here, we continue to watch what's going on in the oil market. We're going to talk more about that in a moment. It was actually the best week for oil uh, going back to early February, up about 3.5% when it comes to WTI. Jared's got a closer look at today's sector action and elsewhere today. Hey, Jared. Hey there, Julie. Uh, you're going to see in the Wi-Fi Interactive behind me, I was looking at the industrials. This is a sector that has really done uh, well this year. Caterpillar up 3.5% for the week. Uh, that is the 11th week of gains. And then GE, that is 13 weeks for what used to be the most uh, popularly retail-owned stock in the universe here, or at least on the solar system. Let's check out the sector action, though. This is over the last five days. Energy, you said WTI crude having its best week since February. Well, guess what? Energy is a beneficiary here. XLC, that's communication services, also in the green, but just about everything else in the red. XLV, that's healthcare, had a bit of a stumble. I believe that's on the Medicare news that came out with respect to pharmacy benefit managers. But then we have real estate down 3%, consumer discretionary, that's retail down 2.8, staples. So the retail tra trade really suffering here and financials not doing that well either. Tech just kind of finishing in the middle of the pack, but still in the red there. Uh, I want to show you what's happening with my leaderboard. Another oil ETF, surprise, surprise, is in the leadership position. That is up 4.1%. Cannabis, we're expecting a lot of cannabis earnings next week. They also did well. Chinese internet, which is uncorrelated with U.S. tech by a long shot, but also New York Fang uh, did pretty well. So that would be some of the mega caps. What did not do well is retail I was telling you about, ARC, that is uh, unprofitable tech, and Bitcoin, and also solar. So the bottom roll, everything down by more than 5%. And it does kind of seem like we're just taking a little bit of a backseat here. I don't want to say the end Indexes are poised to revert, but they have stalled out a bit. And here's the NASDAQ 100. You're going to see kind of an even split between green and red. Josh. Thank you, Jared. It was a wild week for markets, mostly to the downside, but the jobs report driving stocks to close with solid gains. Josh Schaefer here with his takeaways from this busy week. Josh. Yeah, Josh, it's Friday, so I want to zoom out a little bit, and I won't get too overly positive about the jobs report just yet. We can get there. <laughs> um, but when we look at the major indexes for the week, they're going to be down for the week again. And what, what stuck out to me there, guys, is on Fridays, I usually sit down and I have to write our sort of table you setter. get to write. I get to, write. Get to I get, write. I get to write. I'm fortunate enough to write our table setter <laughs> for next week that goes out on Monday, sort of where we're at with markets. And it feels like for the better part of three months now have been writing stocks at record highs and seem to be not caring about anything else that's happening that's bad. And for the first time I'm finally writing, it seems like investors are starting to care a little bit about the risks here. That sort of felt like a little bit of a shift in the narrative to me this week. When we think about some of the Fed speak that we got, it seemed like that sort of caught investors' attention. We had the geopolitical tensions come up yesterday that gave us a spike in oil. We saw that direct correlation between how the NASDAQ acted, the Qs acted with the oil spike, right? And we saw a little bit of a sell-off there. And just the overall inflation story, it seemed like people are starting to hone in on that question a little bit more, which I think in prior weeks, we've been sitting here and sort of wondering, why don't we care about any of these risks? And I, I don't know, maybe we had a little bit of a shift this week? Maybe. Maybe? You're I'm, not sold. Why aren't you sold? I'm not sold. I just don't think we have not uh, Maybe I'm going to play Jay Powell and say we need more data before, sure. <laughs> before we can make that kind of a conclusion. But I did see, you know, this is something you and I have been talking a little bit about because um, when Torsten Slock of Apollo, parent company of Yahoo Finance, first came <laughs> out and said there are not going to be any cuts this year, I, you know, they kind of 
caught, got our attention because mm. no one else was really saying that mm. at that point. Now you have others, including members of the Fed. Federal Reserve officials. Who are at yeah. least bringing up that possibility. It, and it seems like that's going to become a growing part of the conversation overall, if the data were to stay in line and say what we got today, right? We're looking at very strong economic data. But I guess the question, so to go back to your earlier question sure. about whether the market is paying more attention to the risks, that scenario, depending on why they wouldn't be cutting, isn't a risk. Right. If it's because the economy's strong, although I guess if it's because also inflation isn't coming down, I don't know, it depends on why. Yeah, no, I think that is an important thing to point out though, right? There's the no, quote unquote, maybe no landing scenario or no cut scenario that isn't necessarily bad for markets. Right. And I think you guys have had many strategists on this program sort of point that out and that's been a common theme I've found among strategists I've spoken to is if we're not cutting because of strong economic growth, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, I guess, truly, part of what I was getting at here is it seems like the market's maybe just reacting in a more realistic way in that sense. Like, I look at, say, small caps today. It seems like whenever we've had these rallies on positive economic data, small caps have actually outperformed the S&P 500, right? They didn't today. We, we didn't see some crazy rally in something like that. And because small caps, many people would argue, do need cuts, right? So maybe, I don't know if it's considering the risks a little bit more. It seems like maybe we're just... We're getting there a little bit more than we were before, Josh, if that makes sense. And we're yeah. starting to maybe take that, take it into consideration. Yeah. What do you think about, do you hear strategists also, sometimes talking, Josh, about not cutting is a risk in the sense that what if you get a surprise to the economy and then all of a sudden the Fed finds itself in a position like, wow, now we got to cut and cut hard. And so there's some folks who argue you cut a little bit now because you're kind of trying to build in some type of sort of... Uh, supply shock or shock absorber. No, it's definitely a risk, right? But the one thing people bring up with that is the labor market. And I did not see of all the different economic research I was looking through today and some of the economists we speak to, it did not seem like any signs in that non-farm payrolls report that we got today of pure cracks, right? That you would be worried about from the higher restrictive stance. Like that just wasn't really in that report. It Candidly. seemed like the folks who saw it were looking pretty hard right. for, yeah. for it. Yeah. Um, one more thing I wanted to bring up here is energy, yeah. because we've continued to see energy, well, we saw oil have a big up week, mm. and energy stocks continue to sort of catch up with oil prices. Yeah, it's something we've been tracking, right? And Julie, you pointed out to me, Newmont Corp was one of the best performing stocks of the week. It had its be longest winning streak in nine years. Yeah. Uh, and that's a, they have exposure to gold mining and other commodities. And it's just interesting to see if we're going to keep seeing those runs in those stocks. And I guess we, we wrote on our, on our little graphic there, energy wins the week. But part of me wonders if it should just be energy leads the week. And it feels like it's leading the narrative a little bit right now to me from a sense of inflation. It's also part of the inflation story, right? It feels like that is one of the central stories right now. I know we're going to have earnings start next week, and we're going to shift and start talking about different things. But at least the takeaway from this week for me was this spike that we're seeing in energy prices. Not only does what does it mean for XLE and what we're seeing there and energy and potential mining stocks, but also the inflation story. Because it is yes, a growing sure. concern there. And how much of a concern is it going to become, especially if we have some of these tensions in the Middle East continue and yeah. we get a big spike in oil? Yes, it seems to be something that um, economists are watching right now. So yeah. we got to watch it too? Yeah, we do. <laughs> All right, thanks, Josh. Appreciate it. A volatile week in the energy market. We've been talking about this. Both West Texas and Brent crude rising more than 3% on the week. Joining us now, Bob McNally, Rapidan Energy Group founder and President. Bob, you just heard us talking about energy stocks, but I do want to start with the underlying commodity. And an interesting week in which we finally had things sort of moving the needle out of the Mideast, which has not been happening consistently over the course of this conflict. The market seeming to take seriously the idea of Iran retaliating against Israel. Talk to me about how it's being perceived and kind of how it can play out. Thanks, Julie. You know, you're right. Traders understand that the real bullish oil market risk from the Middle East is about Iran. It's not about Gaza. It's not even about the Red Sea. It's about Iran. And you're right. Until this week, traders have pretty much shrugged off what we call Iran contagion risk since early November. What happened in early November? 
the, the Iranian uh, proxy Hezbollah came out and said, look, we're not going to open up a second front. So when everyone said, OK, Iran's best friend in Lebanon, Hezbollah, is not going to open up a second front, traders looked the other way. But that stopped this week when Israel attacked a building in a diplomatic compound. And now, for the first time since early November, the market is pricing in, you know, the big one, uh, the, a direct conflict between Israel and Iran, which there's a small chance that could always bring in the United States were that to kick off. So now it's getting real in the oil markets. Bob, I'm interested when oil becomes, in your opinion, kind of a problem for the Fed. You're looking at Brent here uh, at 91. D does it become a problem, Bob? It, you know, is it is it 95? Is it 100 and staying there? How do you think about it? You know, I'm not uh, the best uh, macro Fed watcher, so I won't claim any expertise there. But from my general experience, I think if it's these levels at 95, 100 dollars are going to stay stick for a while. That's going to be a concern. But remember, the Fed's worried about inflation, and that's consumer goods, and those are crack spreads. So a lot of it is the refining capacity. Are we going to have a stormy summer? Uh, is the retail price of gasoline going to head back to $4 a gallon? It's now a little over $3.50. You know, so I think they're going to be looking at both the crude oil market, the refining market. And if we sort of shift to where we're not in that $70, $80 crude market everyone was thinking about, and we're going to $95 or $100 or higher, and that sticks around, that's going, to, that's going to affect inflation break-evens, investor sentiment, positioning, and that's got to worry the Fed. It's got to slow them down on those, on those cuts. What is the likelihood of that happening, Bob, that kind of price action, especially if we don't see an Iran, you know, sort of flare up here? So if you assume no big increase in geopolitical risk, our models, I think consensus is more or less thinking crude oil prices are fairly valued in the high 80s, $90 range, right? I think it can stay there for a few years. I think we're in the foothills of a multi-year structural cycle that will be very bullish XLE and everything else. But the next year or two, we're probably fairly valued. The downside risk is a recession. That's a known price killer. So there you have it. Um, I think if uh, geopolitical risk comes into the picture, and we think it will, we think there is much more upside, at least 10 more dollars upside, just to the perceived risk uh, of a conflict with Iran, this is not over, um, then I think we go higher still. But I think it's more of a blip back down, and then we position for a structural bull move later this decade. And Bob, what about gasoline at the pump prices? We've had some other strategists say to us that in the past, when prices have gotten to a certain point, consumers have said, well, we're not going to drive as much. And then you've seen the, the prices pull back a little bit. Where, do you think that's the case? And if so, where is that sort of sweet spot or where is the upper limit? Yeah, so, you know, gasoline prices, what we call and demand is sticky, right? Because you don't have a choice. You almost have to buy it. If chicken gets too expensive, you buy beef. Gasoline prices are up. You still got to drive to work. So you need to see something like, uh, Julian, 2022, record high prices of $5 a gallon suddenly on the Russian invasion of Ukraine. We get something like that. I think then you see the consumers start to pull back suddenly. But otherwise, the demand doesn't really respond respond much, again, because people have no choice but to drive to school, to work, et cetera. So I think what you usually see on the macro side is consumer sentiment starts to get bummed out. Consumer confidence in readings go down. They start spending less at Chipotle and other things. They're still buying the gasoline, but they, the consumer sentiment weakens and consumption. I think that's what worries folks about a recession risk. And Bob, I, a question about China as well. You know, the economy over there has been shaky, but then may, maybe some recent data points showing things maybe potentially perking up. How, does, how do you think about China and how does that play into your outlook, Bob? Huge factor, Josh. I mean, macro factors are driving oil uh, to a great degree. And half of that, at least, is China. And as you mentioned, we've had some surprisingly strong PMI and other data from China, right? They're throwing money at the problem. We think domestic demand is still weak, but you know, government can shower money on, on, on investment and so forth, capital expenditures. So that has contributed to the uplift we had in crude. It's not the only thing. Demand readings are strong. Even in Europe, gasoline demand is doing OK. Uh, inventories are starting to draw. So that, that positive macro picture in China since, say, January has definitely been a part of sort of the firming in oil fundamentals recently. Um, and Bob, you mentioned energy stocks. We talked about how the, they've been sort of playing catch up as of late. If you were bullish on energy prices, are you sort of automatically bullish on energy stocks continuing that, that sort of catch up also? Absolutely. Again, we have huge risk. I tell folks, 
we are one bad OPEC plus meeting or one recession away from $20 crude and all of energy stocks getting hosed. There is enormous risk in the market this year and next, okay? But notwithstanding that, if we avoid a recession, if OPEC plus keeps it together, which I think they will, then I think we have a once in a generation light, uh, opportunity to position for a structural boom, uh, boom market in oil. We exited a bust phase from 2015 to 2021. They're always followed by boom phases. I think the market is still diluted a little bit about how quickly EVs are going to kill demand. So I think people are going to wake up and, and smell the gasoline, if you will, and realize we're going to be a lot thirstier for transportation fuels. And when that happens, everyone's going to realize we're undervested. And anyone who's long, you know, sort of oil and gas uh, is going to do very well, I believe. Bob, thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Have a great weekend. Thanks for having me. You too. Thank you. Coming up, we're speaking to Zillow's chief economist to break down the best places to search for those on the hunt to join the list of first-time home buyers. That and much more when market domination overtime returns. Affording a home is no easy feat amid elevated prices and mortgage rates, yet first-time home buyers made up half of all home purchases last year, it's according to Zillow. To break down the best places for those on the hunt to join the list of first-time home buyers, let's get to Zillow Chief Economist Skylar Olson. Skylar, it is good to see you. So you got a new report out, Best Markets for First-Time Buyers. Two questions, Skylar. One, how are you defining best here? And two, yeah. what, what are those markets? 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, as you mentioned, affordability is really a huge challenge out there. So three out of the four metrics in Zillow's index for first time home buyers are going to capture that. The first one is how easy is it to save for the down payment? So we're actually going to look at rent affordability. The third one and or excuse me, second and third are going to capture the affordability of the listings that are actually available because we don't have a lot of inventory uh, out there. And then also how competitive that inventory will be. Now, those three metrics are going to bring forward the Midwest, you know, is really king in this sense. So here, think Indianapolis, St. Louis, um, Detroit, um, but not that's not all. You can move east and you have options like Pittsburgh, say, yeah, exactly here. Thank you so much. Um, or Baltimore. Now, we wanted to balance affordability with livability. And that uh, caused a few of the surprising metros that you see on this list. So rising to the top, uh, Austin and San Antonio. And the metric that's driving this is the share of the population that is between the ages of 29 and 43. In other words, there are a whole heck of a lot of millennials there experiencing the same life challenge. These were really thriving and popular markets over the course of the pandemic. Well, Skylar, it's always interesting to see these kinds of lists. However, if mm. I'm buying my house for a first time, I probably yeah. am working in a particular place. And, uh, you know, uh, so in other words, like, I can't just like say, oh, this is a great market to buy a house. Like, I got to have a job there to, to move there. Right. Yeah. So, so I'm just curious, like how much uh, what utility these kinds. I mean, it's great if you're already living there. You can pat yourself on the back or you can start looking for a house. But yeah. if you don't, what do you do with yeah. this information? <laughs> Well, gosh, that's interesting that you bring this up. I mean, we actually see in you know census data that people actually move more uh, when, or rather, move farther these days uh, when things are unaffordable because you know you might need to move in order to access the lifestyle that you have in mind. Particularly, well, rather, it depends on where you live. Now, that said, you bring up a great point. A lot of us kind of fund our lives through the support of our communities. Maybe it's the childcare, you know, that your parents kind of offer you. And that kind of financial support can be critical. You know, for a lot of people, becoming a buyer is going to happen, you know, further down the road because you're going to need to save up uh, for that down payment, which is why we actually included rent affordability in this index for that reason. You know, down payments are still challenging because prices have not fallen despite high mortgage rates. And I think, you know, the primary reason why we surface these kinds of lists, honestly, is to shake up people's curiosity about different opportunities across the country and get you to consider maybe different options. But that might mean across your metro, right, a smaller place um, or one further out, you know, is generally what people kind of consider when their buying power drops in high mortgage rates. Skylar, let's see your viewer listing right now. You are on the hunt for a home. Any guidance, Skylar? Any, any kind of tips and tricks? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, because affordability is king, you really want to get pre-approved ahead of time to know what, what you can afford. Um, and then also consider shopping by monthly payments, say. You can do this on Zillow. That ends up being valuable when mortgage rates jump around, which can really change your buying power. So don't just search for that you know, price of the home. Your feasibility to access that home might change over time as mortgage rates change. So shopping by mortgage payment can be valuable. And then there are not a lot of listings out there, which also uh, means that there aren't a lot of examples and sample sizes for uh, agents to go off of. So an experienced agent with a lot of local experience is actually pretty critical in navigating and making sure you can understand the list prices or the prices that you see out there, because it can be pretty shocking. It is still unaffordable uh, in that sense. But we've got a lot of people, I think, hoping to move forward, large generations of millennials wanting to be first-time home buyers. Well, and Skylar, the other side of this is that you guys just also came out with some research that said there are now 550, 550 uh, <laughs> cities in the U.S. where the average price of a home or the oh, typical yeah. home value is a million dollars or more. Um, and I don't know yeah. what we know about um, salaries, for example, in those cities as well, if they're sort of keeping up. But, you know, again, it speaks to this affordability issue. 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, there are more million dollar cities than last year. And I think that's surprising to people when you think like, surely the prices are coming down with mortgage rates as high as they are and the affordability challenge. We've seen so few new listings come onto the market because sellers or, or excuse me, owners are holding on um, that prices have actually increased over this past uh, year. That increases the number of million dollar cities. And if you want to think about where those places are, think California, think New York, uh, think Colorado. Um, now, Texas also has a lot of million dollar cities being as large as it is, but it actually dropped in the number of million dollar cities uh, in Texas simply because we are building a lot there. And that's one of the few places where we actually are seeing the typical value of a home come down. Skyler, thanks so much for joining us. Have a great weekend. Yeah, take care, guys. Time now for what to watch next week, starting off on the economy. We're getting some key pieces of economic data next week. CPI report coming out on Wednesday. Economists forecast to get three-tenths of a percent gain in March. And year over year, the estimate is for CPI to be up 3.4%. And following that report, we get the PPI coming out on Thursday. That also expects to show prices to be rising at a slower pace, giving us more insight as potential rate cuts hang in the balance. And moving over to the Federal Reserve, we're getting minutes from the Fed's March meeting. It's holding rates steady in March. Of course, it held ste rates steady in March. And the latest dot plot showed most Fed officials see three rate cuts this year. That sentiment shifting with Fed Governor Michelle Bowman saying today that a rate hike could be needed if inflation stays high. Not her base case, however. And taking a look at earnings, the financial sector kicking off earnings season. J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, BlackRock, Citigroup, and State Street all reporting next Friday. J.P. Morgan announcing first quarter earnings before the bell on Friday. Analysts expecting the largest U.S. bank buy assets to eclipse year-over-year -year earnings on higher revenues. And speaking of eclipses, Josh, there's a total solar eclipse on Monday. In case you have not heard, it will cross over the Texas border around 1 p.m. Eastern with totality, uh, that is, complete coverage of the sun at 2.30 p.m. Eastern. Be sure to put on your protective eyewear. I will. Can I borrow one? You have a pair for me? Or? I give it to you. I can't wear it. You get a couple? Do. You didn't think of your uh, co-anchor? I, I, I got them for my kids. I'll, I got to work on myself still to see. By the way, I'm off on Friday when all those companies are putting on these. Nice. Sorry. All right. Okay. We'll miss you. <laughs> I'm sure. That'll do it for today's Market Domination Overtime. Be sure to come back to, on Monday for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell. Stay tuned. We're Yahoo Finance on the other side.
Shares of United Airlines on the move downward in after hours trading. The company reportedly calling off its May investor day in the wake of a string of safety incidents uh, tied to Boeing planes. Uh, this is according to Bloomberg. If you look on United's investor relations page, it's still listing that that investor day is happening on May 1st, the morning of May 1st. But Bloomberg reporting uh, that the company is saying in an internal um, email, uh, an email sent to investors and industry analysts that it would send the wrong message to sort of be touting its performance given what is happening safety-wise in the industry. Yeah, and, and you know, there have been all, you know, listen, Julie, we've talked about these headlines of these issues, you know, wheel that flew off a Boeing jet, um, you had the, the plane that ran off a runway in Houston. So they have been making headlines for all, all the wrong reasons. And on top of that, you know, Bloomberg also did report that regulators have been reviewing kind of United safety procedures. Mm -hmm. So there's been a lot of news and not all of it's been too great. Right, exactly. So, um, you know, we'll see what ends up, uh, ends up following on this and if we'll get confirmation um, for United about uh, this cancellation. YouTube superstar Mr. Beast is going to Amazon, the content creator recently striking a deal with Amazon MGM Studios for his first traditional streaming series. For more on what this means for the streaming landscape and maybe if this is a trend to come, we're bringing in Paul Pastor. He's co-founder and chief business officer of Quick Play. Um, and Paul, um, thank you so much for joining us. First of all, just to sort of set the stage here, talk to us about what Quick Play does and sort of, you know, your view on the streaming industry from where you sit. Certainly. Well, thank you so much for having me today. Uh, so Quick Play is an OTT, or over-the-top television uh, service provider. Uh, we support what we call Tier 1 operators, sports, uh, sports rights holders, and media groups. Uh, so what does a Tier 1 operator mean? It means somebody who has a very complex ecosystem that's maybe managing uh, legacy systems and legacy business models, as well as current and future ones with streaming. Uh, they happen to have uh, really, um, they want control over their roadmap and they want to make sure that they can, can can respond to the various needs of their consumers. And importantly, they have very big executives who often come in with a, a request or demand that are looking for new features, new innovations that lead the market. Uh, and they're looking for platforms like ourselves to help them drive that, uh, that change in their organization. Um, in terms of the industry, it's an unbelievable time to be involved in the industry. Uh, we're seeing a tremendous amount of change. Uh, I started in the industry when we when cable was being developed, right? And then we had digital terrestrial television that was in the process of transforming the industry. Um, and now most of the business models that I set up maybe 20 years ago have now folded as now streaming becomes the topic du jour. Uh, but there's a tremendous number of trends in the industry at this moment that I'm sure you're seeing. First and foremost, obviously, there's a tremendous amount of focus on cost at this moment. Uh, where streamers are rationalizing their content investment, uh, their marketing investment, and importantly, their technology investment. Uh, second, you've seen a tremendous amount of consolidation in the industry uh, where people are looking to aggregate in order to offer a better value proposition to consumers. And then fundamentally, uh, there is you know, the management of their uh, and focus on profitability as they sunset many of their older businesses that were huge profit drivers uh, and transform these into their new profit drivers. And Paul, this this news, you know, uh, of Mr. Beast um, and, and this deal with Prime Video, is, is that a trend we're, we're seeing, Paul? Sort of the, these big these big names, these big influencers cutting these kind of high profile content deals. Absolutely. Listen, this is a tried and true model, right? Uh, we always in, in Hollywood like to greenlight projects that have big stars attached because it reduces the risk. There's built-in equity with the consumer in terms of how to follow these uh, these stars. So this is a very tried and true model. What Amazon has done in stealing the talent from YouTube or borrowing or leveraging the brand uh, from YouTube into their program with a huge prize, they made a huge splash. But let's not forget that there's other businesses that are out there that are fundamentally pursuing the very same thing, which is how to uh, democratize content through YouTube, like a pocket watch or a moon bug that focus on the kids area, but then build out these incredible franchises that they then, then take to more uh, traditional streaming or traditional media platforms. Uh, another one you saw was Morphe, for example, that was announced this year, uh, coming from YouTube, from Moonbug, that will now be available on Disney and Disney+. Plus. Uh, so this is most certainly a model that Hollywood's familiar with. It presents a great opportunity, obviously, for influencers and those who build their brands in these uh, more democratized platforms uh, to be able to extend that IP, to extend their talents, 
uh, and really grow uh, a, a, what is a you know basically production company and franchise business uh, through these other various platforms. I, I am curious, Paul, what the what the ROI is on something like this, right? Because just to give a you know anecdotal example, my kids are Mr. Beast fans. Um, they watch him on YouTube. I don't know if they're going to be interested to watch this show on Amazon. So I just wonder what kind of migration or, you know, if not migration, sharing Amazon is going to get from this. What kind of incremental increase in subscribers? What do you think? Uh, certainly. Well, first of all, I think you started with what is the ROI for the consumer, uh, which I think is a really important piece. Uh, and Amazon made a big splash with saying they're going to offer the largest cash prize at $5 million. So that has that's going to hopefully draw in some of the talent. But most certainly, they're going to have to figure out how to translate what has been a more of a short form uh, format into a longer term, for, uh, a longer uh, format. They may have multiple episodes that can really drive fan engagement all across the, uh, the platform. The second piece from an Amazon perspective, right? Um, Amazon always has a very different model. They uh, monetize us through uh, any number of different ways in which they grab the stickiness of us from uh, whether that is our shopping habits, whether that is subscribing to Prime and others. I'm sure sitting behind it, they're thinking about how do we grow our share of eyeballs? How do we then think about, uh, as they've expanded into ad sales, how to monetize that through ad sales? And then what are the other touch points we have with consumers where we can drive increased spend and attention uh, to ultimately uh, drive back that ROI? And Paul, last question here, you know, we, we talk about Mr. Beast, but there, there's not many Mr. Beasts out there, right? Pretty, pretty unique guy in terms of just superstar power, Paul. For relatively, let's say, you know, smaller um, influences, influencers, are there also opportunities, Paul, to cut similar kind of content deals? Uh, most certainly. I mean, we see this all the time in commercials, right? Uh, that they will find lower, uh, maybe talent doesn't have 250 million followers like we've seen in Mr. Beast, uh, to be able to develop brand affinities and help sell across their brands. We also see new services like passes.com uh, uh, developed by Lucy Gao, who is, who's fundamentally trying to figure out how do we actually take influencers and fundamentally help them build bigger businesses, bigger presences, and professionalize what they do. So there, I think this is a trend you're gonna continue to see. It's like I said, it's a model that Hollywood loves, which is understanding talent, how to leverage the ecosystem to draw the attention around their, uh, their IP, around their new show, uh, how to leverage the entire uh, cacophony of noise, right, around the opportunity and drive marketing and, and, and viewership into their platform. Paul, thanks so much for joining the show today. Appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. Women's college basketball pulling in record viewership and ticket sales this year. Up next, we're going to talk how the sport can continue to capitalize on all this hype.
It's been a record-breaking 2024 for college basketball, especially for women. The Monday night showdown between Iowa and LSU pulled in a whopping 12.5 million viewers. That was the biggest audience ever for a women's college basketball game. Women's college basketball has soared in popularity over the past few years, but the question remains, can women's sports continue to build on this hype? And joining us now to discuss, Josh Walker, co-founder and CEO of Sports Innovation Lab. Josh, it's good to see you. So there does, you know, Josh, it seemed to be this real shift underway in, in women's basketball, Josh. Just the, the energy and the enthusiasm that, you know, Caitlin Clark and, and Angel Reese are kind of generating right now. What, what do you think, um, bottom line, Josh, this is really going to mean just for the business overall of women's sports? Yeah, I think you need to zoom, zoom out a little bit, right? So it, first of all, it's really cool that you know their names because I think in this day and age, it's like they've become part of the common vernacular when you're talking about sports, and that's phenomenal. We saw this trend coming about three years ago, and you really have to zoom out. This is not an overnight success. This is not just a Caitlin Clark story. This is a phenomenon that has been building for a while now. Women's sports has actually been like a startup, and it's not an overnight success. We say that all the time in our business. We've been looking at this since the inception of Title IX and really starting to create equality in terms of the media distribution, the salaries, the college game, even in the amateur and youth level. It's really taken decades for the women's sports infrastructure to be built up so that we can now have this moment that we're all talking about. And so it's interesting then because it sounds like it has been – a deliberate effort, right? And although certainly there must be an organic element to it too. But talk to me about the deliberate part. Sort of what is that infrastructure look like? What are the efforts that um, various folks out there like yourselves who have been trying to build this fan base? How do you how have you done it? Yeah, well, we've done it with data. Um, and we've started with evidence that I think the industry had been missing for a long period of time. A lot of the selling of women's sports was done on the equality and the you know, emotional, it's the right thing to do kind of message. Uh, my co-founder is Angela Ruggiero, one of the best hockey players of all time. She's in the Hockey Hall of Fame. Very good friends with Billie Jean King. She's really taken the mantle and said, this is about the business of sports. This isn't about the right thing to do. This is the right investment. And my CMO, Gina Waldhorn, runs a group of women that's about 300 women called the Women's Sports Club. And I only mention that because that's 300 executives that get together, talk about women's sports, and talk about the opportunities to invest in women's sports. So when you ask me about the infrastructure, the infrastructure is this groundswell of emotion that is now being translated into an ROI in terms of investing. And I think when that transition happened, when you started looking at the data behind this narrative, it started to be something that these brands could get behind. Uh, the media companies now are spending real money on media rights. And then you have Morgan Stanley, you have Klarna, you have Scripps, you have EA Sports. Lots of other brands are leaning in now and trying to make an investment to make sure that women's sports is funded correctly going forward. And Josh, I'm interested in what you think women's college basketball uh, could mean for the WNBA as a business, Josh. Do you think it's going to help the league gain more traction? Without a doubt. We, we shared a lot of data with folks this week just showing how the WNBA is trending as a result of some of the momentum around March Madness. Now, remember, March Madness wasn't a logo or a mark that the women's game could use in the past. That even just putting a stamp on what's really legitimized this tournament, which has been going on forever, is now just giving the WNBA that kind of momentum as it leads into the draft, into the to the next season. The WNBA has been doing a great job. They have a new app. They've been doing a lot more with their marketing and with the team level. So we work closely with the WNBA, are really impressed with sort of how they're professionalizing the game. But make no mistake, they're benefiting from these big names that are coming out of college basketball. And, and also, Josh, who is the fan here? Is it mostly women? Is it young women? And, and kind of what's the spending power of this cohort? We, we spend so much time um, disavowing people of the idea that it's just the dad and his daughter going to the games. We show that there is really a tremendous amount of interest in all women's sports. 
and it's not just basketball. It could be, you know, a softball fan that also watches basketball that tends to go out because they enjoy a night out with with their family. This is a very well-rounded fan base. It's not one demographic. It's not one type of fan. And I think that's the most powerful thing that the data shows, which is that they're actually buying a lot of products and services. We did a really great study with the WNBA to show them that when they started working with CarMax, CarMax consumers rewarded the WNBA with their business. And I think that there's a really nice connection when you look at the data that says that they want these brands and they want these leagues to be working together very closely. Josh Walker, thank you so much. Really appreciate really interesting stuff. Yeah, it is. It's a super exciting time for women's sports. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Hope to talk to you again. Okay, bye-bye. That'll do it for today's Yahoo Finance Live. Be sure to come back on Monday at 3 p.m. Eastern for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell. Have a great weekend. Well, the commercial space economy is on track to reach $1 trillion by 2040, according to Citigroup. Colorado-based Sierra Space is at the heart of that, with ambitions to build out a new commercial space station in partnership with Blue Origin. Its space plane, Dream Chaser, recently completed testing at NASA and is scheduled to launch into orbit later this year. For more on that, let's. Uh, we are joined by CEO Tom Weiss, who is in studio today. And Tom, I'm sorry I can't join you in New York, but it is great to talk to you. Let's start by talking about where Dream Chaser stands right now. What's the timeline and what's the mission? Yeah, uh, first of all, just thank you for having us uh, today. Uh, look forward to having the discussion. Dream Chaser, we're very excited about Dream Chaser. We've made tremendous progress coming out of seven years of development on the program. Um, we're finishing up testing uh, with NASA uh, out at you know, uh, their test facility in Ohio. Um, uh, about two or three weeks from now, we'll ship Dream Chaser to Kennedy Space Center. Uh, we'll finish up some testing at Kennedy Space Center, integrate it on the Vulcan rocket, and we're excited it'll have its first mission to the ISS later this year. 
this is the only space plane, as I understand it, uh, capable of landing on a commercial runway. What are the use cases as you see it? Well, the, the way we see it, I mean, we think about really since the 1960s, every a science experiment or human being that's come back to Earth from space, even today, is still landing in a capsule in the ocean. Um, and yet, the, the science is very sensitive. Um, we think changing and revolutionizing the way that we bring things back from space, both humans and cargo, and landing it back at a commercial runway will, again, uh, it completely accelerate the new space economy. I mean, imagine being able to create biotech hubs around the world so that we could Japan. Same thing in the Middle East. Uh, it's, it's really incredible for us to think about just bringing things back to a commercial runway. We spent a lot of time and, and, and technology associated with being able to land Dream Chaser at any runway that a commercial aircraft can land. And we think that's going to create a new economy around being able to do that. Uh, that's very, you know, we focused uh, around uh, getting Dream Chaser to be able to land in Huntsville, Alabama, uh, out in New Mexico, of course, Kinney Space Center, Vandenberg. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work around OIDA in Japan, and you can, can see us uh, continue uh, to really uh, uh, form relationships with airports so we can bring Dream Chaser back to commercial runways. Let's talk a bit more about uh, those business opportunities you just pointed to. Uh, Dream Chaser initially is going to be supplying to the International Space Station, but you're also building out a commercial space station in partnership with Blue Origin. Um, you know, it's been so many decades where we're so used to seeing one space station, a place of cooperation between countries, and yet here we are looking into the future where you've got not just competing space stations between countries, but also commercial space stations as well. Um, how does that open up the business opportunities within the space economy? Yeah, what we see in the commercial space station is the opportunity to create brand new research and development facilities for biotech, industrial tech, energy tech. Uh, we believe that the next big breakthrough products in oncology, longevity, industrialized components like glass will be produced in, in low Earth orbit. This is, uh, we're transitioning from you know, decades of, of government-run space stations with just a handful of government-trained astronauts to the full commercialization of low-Earth orbit. Um, if you think about the biotech industry today, terrestrial markets, uh, most of that work is being done in what's called contract research organizations, contract manufacturing organizations. Uh, part of the work that Sierra Space is doing is producing the first CRO in space for biotech the first contract manufacturing facilities in space for industrial tech. And we think that's going to create, we believe, probably the most profound industrial revolution and grow that space economy, as you mentioned, to well over a trillion dollars by 2040. Uh, Tom, you talk specifically about biotech. Why is that environment, microgravity, so conducive to development there? Because you can actually build really pure protein crystallizations. And that protein crystallization is what is the foundation of being able to create new and novel drugs. Uh, we think a lot about um, being able to greatly expand adult stem cells that can take on a number of human conditions. Um, we're very focused on being able to print 3D organs in space in microgravity that you can't do on the surface. So the combination of work that we're doing uh, in oncology and longevity using microgravity uh, because of that unique environment, we can do things specifically around crystallization of protein structures that you can't do on Earth. Uh, the same thing we can do in inorganic, so industrialized glass. The purity of the glass you can build in orbit is very differentiated than on, on the ground. Uh, finally, Tom, Sierra Space is a privately held company right now. You've been very vocal about your ambitions to go public eventually. I heard you recently say um, you'll do this when the market looks like it'll give Sierra Space the right credit for valuation. What, what is that? What, what does that look like? And could we potentially see an IPO this year? Yeah, you know, uh, again, we, uh, we spun out from a, a great company, the, one of the world's greatest private defense companies, Sierra Nevada Corporation, three years ago. Uh, we spent the last three years de-risking our technology stack, de-risking our capital structure, de-risking our business plan. We have a significant, wide, diverse portfolio of products and revenue streams. 
Um, and so we think about uh, as the private markets, now looking at the public markets, uh, we'll time that right, um, but it provides us a lot of optionality around access to additional capital as we think about growing the company over the next uh, decade. And so the timing of that is uh, we'll look at the public markets. You know, we're valued as a private company at 5.3 billion. Uh, we've raised $1.7 billion in capital through our Series A and B. Uh, we're well uh, capitalized. Uh, but now we look at the public markets over the next 12, 18 months, and we'll make a decision on what the right timing for us is. Tom Weiss, uh, CEO of Sierra Space, really appreciate you joining us today. Thanks so much for your Oh, time. thank you so much for having us. Really appreciate it.